that the prophets he's spoken on is not that he's focusing on are the false prophets. He he every derogatory term that he can use he uses for the prophets. He's not talking about godly prophets. He's talking about ungodly prophets. And I want you to think about, remember when we come to prophecy, we can never remove the people who are hearing it. Zechariah is preaching, speaking to post-exilic people who survived the exile into Babylon. And now they're come back into the land. And the Lord is saying, he's talking about a future cleansing through the blood of Messiah they, they're not fully going to understand that, right? They just know there's a day when, when we're going to, our hearts are going to be broken because we've hurt God. That's what they understand. They understand. Now, they could be thinking about that through their idolatry. They could be thinking about that through their sin. Are you guys tracking with me? But they know there's going to be a day when our hearts will be broken and the Lord's going to pour out upon us a spirit of grace and mercy and, and we're going to find cleansing in his fountain. And now he he's tells them, look, I'm going to get rid of this idolatry. Idolatry has been a problem with mankind since the fall, right? We're always looking for something to worship. And we'll worship something, it doesn't matter. We all have idols. We just, maybe we don't call them Ashtoreth, we just call them Netflix. But we have something that, that sucks up all our desire, right? We want to spend all our time, you know, binge watching or whatever things are, that are going on. And so we can fall into that same thing. The Lord says, look, there's a day I'm going to remove it all and I'm going to get rid of all the false prophets. When Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel were, were prophesying to the people going into exile, the problem that they had is there were always false prophets who would rise up and tell the people what they want to hear. Do you ever notice that? There are always people who will rise up and tell them what they want to hear. And the Lord is saying, man, I'm going to get rid of idolatry and false prophets. It's going to go. And he's got some illustrations of this. As he works his way through, he's got some illustrations that he's going to describe. And we want to pay careful attention to them so that we don't uh, misunderstand what it is that he's talking about. So he says, I will remove from the lamb the prophets, speaking of false prophets, and the spirit of uncleanness. Now, verse three, and if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say, you shall not live for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him will pierce him through when he prophesies. Now, there's a guy just lost his name again. Phineas, I think it's Phineas. There's a guy in the Old Testament named Phineas. Now, I want you to understand this story as an example. The children of Israel, after the sin of Balaam, remember Balaam prophesies, he talks to, to uh, king, you guys look it up. He talks to a king. What, Balak? It's Balak and Balaam? Man, this is hard, you know. The brain is a scary thing when you're this old. So, <laughs> Things just go away. But anyways, when he's, I know it's going to get worse. So when he's, Balaam talks to him and he says, listen, I, I, I just send your pretty girls down there and the Israelites will fall into sexual sin and God will have to judge them. And so they did that. The Israelites fell into sin. God judged them. 30,000 people have died. The children of Israel are gathered around the tabernacle. Moses is there. They're crying out for God's deliverance. They're crying out. They're mourning over their sin. They're mourning over what has gone on. And the scripture tells us that an Israelite comes walking through the midst of the camp with a girl from, uh, from the other king. And as he comes walking in, they walk into a tent to be sexually immoral. And Phineas picks up a spear and he walks into the tent and he pierces them. He drives his spear through them both. And the moment that he does it, God's judgment ends, just stops. Now, what Zechariah is talking about is that parents who have given birth to their, their own child are going to be so 
adhere so strictly to the code of obedience to God that if their son was to utter a false prophecy, they're going to pierce him like Phineas. And it's the same word used of how the, what I would say is the example of God in the earlier chapter in chapter 12. And they will look upon me, God speaking, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they'll mourn as one mourns for an only son. The picture being that in or through or because of their sin, God has been pierced through a picture of what's going to happen to Christ. What is, why is Jesus pierced? Why does he die on a cross? For what? For sin, right? He's, gonna, he's dealing with our sin, not his own, right? Isaiah 53 says, not for his own. So the same way, they're going to look at their son and they're going to pierce him so that he will not do that which is disobedient to God. The point is not for, ch- for parents to go around and kill their children. The point is the attitude. Understand the attitude that has changed. Because before the children of Israel were were like the guys just grabbing the girl and going to have sex wherever. They don't care who's dying or what, who's, how does the spirit of the world look at that today? Isn't that how they consider it? What's the big deal? Who cares? Do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. But the Lord is saying he's going to get rid of idolatry and the false prophet and the attitude of the people is going to change. And the change of the attitude of the people would be so, uh, so stark that parents would pierce their own child for being a false prophet. Now look as he continues to develop the idea, verse 4. And on that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. So basically, false prophets are going to shut up. All the false prophets, instead of saying, giving the message everybody wants to hear, they're all going to stop. They're all going to stop prophesying. They're going to be ashamed of themselves. And they're going to stop with the disobedience to the Spirit of God. Because it is a harsh thing for someone to assume upon themselves the right to say, thus saith the Lord. Today, I will tell you, today, now, the best way to do that is when you're reading the Bible to someone. Right? Because I know when I'm reading the Bible to someone, thus saith the Lord. Now, I'm not going to say God doesn't speak. I believe that the gift of prophecy still exists and that God does still speak that way. But you should not just take that upon yourself flippantly. Right? and say, the Lord has told me if he hasn't spoken. So this is what he's saying. He's saying the prophets who have done that on that day, every prophet who's like that, he's going to stop. He's not going to do it. He's going to be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. Listen to this. He will not put on a hairy cloak. (laughs) So you may not know this, but the Old Testament prophets had a mantle. And the mantle was how their authority would be established. For example, Elijah passes, passes his mantle to Elisha. So the idea is that when John the Baptist comes on the scene, what's he look like? He looks like Elijah. He's wearing the garb of Elijah. So if you were a false prophet and you wanted to feel important and that everybody would listen to your words, you would dress like Elijah. But he's saying here, they're going to stop doing that. They're going to stop dressing up on the outside like that which they are not. It's going to stop. Now, if you're someone who just spent 70 years in captivity, and then for the last almost 20 years, you've been rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple, and you get this word from the prophet, you're thinking, oh, man, that would be so awesome because we just got out of a life sentence, right? Be awful nice to not have it again. The Lord says on that day, that's going to be dealt with. That's going to be gone. He will not put on the hairy cloak in order to deceive. But he will say, 
I am no prophet. I'm a worker of the field. I'm a farmer. I'm just a farmer. Now, Amos says the same thing. Amos says when, when he's prophesying to the people, he's like, hey, 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 I'm just a farmer. I wouldn't even be here except God told me I have to come. And when God tells you you have to come, what do you do? You go. But this is saying of those prophets, they're going to say, instead of assuming I'm a prophet, they're going to say, I am no prophet. I'm a worker of the soil. Uh, for a man sold me in my youth. This is what I've always been taught to do. This is how I'm going to act. These are the things I'm going to do. And then we come to verse 6. Now, verse 6, depending on what version you're reading, is going to read different. King James is going to sound very different. New King James, a little different. ESV, NASB, NIV, they're going to they're going to be a little bit closer to the actual meaning. But if you don't understand what's being said, you can make some different decisions when you get here. Look what it says in verse 6. And if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. So there's two things that we want to understand in this verse. What's literally being said is, what are these wounds between your arms? What are these wounds? Another way for us to say it, it's a Hebrew idiom, a figure of speech. It would be like us saying, I got them right between the shoulder blades. Which, which part of your body is that? Your back. It could be your chest, right? So there is, um, uh, let me see if I, if I wrote it down. Yeah, 2 Kings 9.24 uses the same phrase, 2 Kings 9.24, and Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders. So the arrow pierced his heart and he sank from his chariot. Same phrase. So shot him between his shoulders, the arrow went through his back or through his chest. Doesn't matter, either way, the heart's in between, right? We know that. So he is talking about these wounds. Now, King James... Uh, when, the, when the King James translators put it together, they said these wounds in his hands. They'll ask him, where did you get the wounds in your hands? And he will say, I got it in the house of my friends. Now, you could understand why some people would say, oh, it's Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. He was pierced in his hands, right? But if we understand a little bit more about the language, we can go, oh, no, 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 no. He's talking about false prophets. He's not saying Jesus is a false prophet, right? He's saying false prophets are going to deny that they're false prophets and someone's going to come up to them and ask them, now why are they going to ask a false prophet about the wounds on his back? Why would he go, why would they say, I wonder, I wonder why the, what, what's the deal with the false prophet and the wounds on his back? Why would they ask him this question? Well, if we remember if we go back to Elijah, you guys remember Elijah and his battle with the 400 priests of Baal? And they're calling out for fire from heaven. You remember what they did? They cut themselves. They cut themselves. And set, in fact, the Bible says they cut themselves so much blood was spurting all over. And so the idea is they're burying in their bodies the wounds of idolatrous worship and someone's going to come to them and say, hey, where did you get these wounds? And they're not going to say, I'm a prophet. They're going to say, I got these in the house of my friends. And that word friends is an interesting word too. Because it, it, it intimates that it's not friends like I'm just hanging out with my friends, but friends in... Uh, idolatrous worship like you would have it's the same phrasing that they use in regard <coughs> excuse me to the to the uh, male prostitutes worshiping in idolatry and so that's the it's the same phrase that would be used for that so he's saying look i got these wounds on my back i got these wounds on my chest between my shoulders between my hands i got these wounds as a result of worshiping idols but that's not who I am anymore. 
That's not who I am anymore because there's no idolatry in the land and there's no false prophecy in the land because Jesus Christ has come and delivered. And one of the greatest things that we see that Jesus Christ accomplishes by his blood is the transformation of a life from what it was to what we can be in Christ Jesus. Amen? <coughs> so he's describing these very things. Deuteronomy, um, Deuteronomy 14, 1 and 2. He says, you are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourself or make baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you. He's saying in Deuteronomy, don't do this cutting like they do. Now it's not about, has nothing to do with tattooing. It has everything to do with the worshiping of false gods, the cutting of the body and scarring the body in a way that honors <coughs> the false gods. Zechariah, we're going to see uh, um, as we continue in verse 7, he's going to lift up his eyes now and look to again how this is accomplished. So you have... <clears throat> a picture first. Okay, so here, there's going to be a time of mourning. People are going to cry out. God's going to bring salvation. A fountain that washes them clean, takes away all uncleanliness. False prophets are done away with. Idolatry is taken away. Lives are transformed. People are changed. The, the people who had power as a false prophet are going to lay all those things down. How's this all going to happen? So, he goes on in Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against who? My shepherd. Against the man who stands next to me. Again, this is God talking. It's only one person that, that there are sometimes they try to, people will try to take this, this prophecy and they'll say, well, this is this king or example of this priest or whatever in history but because he says look this is the one who stands next to me it's my associate who can be the associate of god jesus and we're going to see this very thing quoted and again the reason why my tendency is to see fulfillment is because when jesus quotes it and says this is about to happen then i expect this is about to happen Okay, so I don't, I, I, it's, it's a hard sell for me to go, this is about to happen, but it's going to be spread out over 2,000 years. Now, I think it's going to happen the way it's laid out, and we'll talk about that as we take a look. So he says, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man <coughs> who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Sound familiar? Matthew 26, 31. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away from me. Um, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So that, Jesus said that happened when he was arrested, right? Because at his arrest, he's going to go to trial, then he's going to die on the cross. Boom, boom, boom. The sword will strike the shepherd, and the sheep are going to scatter. But what else does the prophecy say? And I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now, I, wanna, I don't want to just try to make crazy assertions on who are the little ones. I'm just going to read the next verse. So what does the next verse tell us about it? Verse 8, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. Now again, when we come to this prophecy, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought we'll walk through tonight believes that uh, this happened shortly after the, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It occurred in history. 
And there's one group that believes this is yet to happen in the tribulation period. And at the end, I'll give you a conclusion on, on what happens depending on, on which way we go with, with whatever you think. But I would encourage you, again, be Bereans. Search the scriptures and see. So he says, who are these little ones? Well, they're the people in the whole land. He's talking about the whole land. I'm going to turn my hand against the little ones. What's the next thing he says? Two-thirds are going to get cut off and perish. So I'm going to take two-thirds of the population of the land out. And one-third is going to make it. So how could this or when could this have taken place historically? First, he lays out the idea. Destruction is coming. And then he tells us the place where it's going to come, in the whole of the land. <clears throat> when he uses that phrase, in the whole of the land, he's talking about Israel. His focus is on Israel, the people that are cut off, two-thirds of the population. Now, this is easy for, for history to assert because we don't really know for sure how many people, we can't count them. You know, they don't have, they were not, the census of the ancient world is not super accurate. Are, are you aware? So you're going to have to decide, right, as you consider the evidence, what way do you think this is going to go? But let's look at what happened historically before we make a decision. Now, the Bible tells us that roughly 40 years after the death of Christ, Titus Vespasian and the Russian army surrounded Jerusalem. In, in Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24, uh, Mark chapter 13, Jesus told the people in Jerusalem what to do if that happened. He said, when you see the armies surrounding the city, what did he tell them to do? Get out. Flee to the mountains of Judah. Get away. Why? because destruction has come. You remember what Jesus said in those chapters? He said, not one stone will be left on another, right? They're all going to be thrown down. So he lays out this prophecy. Now, Josephus, in the War of the Jews, book six, chapter nine, section three, you guys can get this book. It's not hard. I don't know if they got it in our library, but they certainly have it somewhere in a library. <coughs> I have it in my library, so... You're welcome to come read it. Uh, it says, now the number of those who were carried captive during the first Jewish-Roman war was collected to be 97,000, and the number of those that perished during the siege of Jerusalem, 1.1 million. The greater part of whom were indeed of the same nation of Israel, uh, but not belonging necessarily to the city of Jerusalem itself. Now you need to understand when a Roman army, when the Roman army is coming against the rebellion of Israel that started roughly 63 to 66, they started to rebel against Rome. As that army is coming toward Jerusalem, where, what's it doing to all the people? Where are all the people fleeing to? They're all going to Jerusalem. They're all going to, they're all going to, he's going to, this army is going to push, fight battles through the outer regions until it has pushed all the people into Jerusalem. It's going to surround Jerusalem and choke it off. They're going to turn off the power. Does that sound familiar? They're going to turn off the water. They're going to turn off everything. That's what siege warfare is. So you have 97,000 and 1.1 million dead. The assertion is that is roughly two-thirds of the nation of Israel at the time. But you still have another group, don't you? It says a third is going to go through the fire. They're going to go through. They go through the same war, right? They go through the same struggles, but they're going to come out. The assertion is this is believing Israel at the time of the destruction of the temple. There's a few quotes I'm going to share with you from early church fathers. These are guys who are the first couple of generations after the disciples. 
Okay? So these guys, this is what they wrote about it. Uh, Eusebius, Church History, Book 3, Chapter 5, Section 3. The people of the church in Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to those in the city who were worthy of it to depart and dwell in one of the cities of Perea, which they call Pella. Uh, to it, those <coughs> who believed in Christ traveled from Jerusalem so that the holy men had altogether deserted the royal capital of the Jews, the whole land of Judea. What the early church writers are going to write is that all believing Israel, that's the nation of Israel who believed Jesus was her Messiah, they're going to listen to the prophecy that Jesus made and they leave. So the assertion is that third is the third that survives. Two thirds are destroyed. One third survives. And they go to Pella and they find, um, they find uh, uh, solace there. <clears throat> so again, Luke 21, 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know the desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains that those who are inside the city get out. Let those who are out of the country never enter it for these are the days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. That's Luke 21. So they, these guys leave um, before the destruction that falls upon uh, the temple and Jerusalem at that time. Here's Epiphanius, uh, his book, Panorion, book 29, chapter 7, section 7 and 8. He's uh, talking about a heresy. He says, the heresy of the Nazareans exists in Beroea. In the neighborhood of Coeli, Syria, and the Decapolis, in the region of Pella, and in Bassanidus, in the so-called Kokoba, uh, from Pella. It took its beginning, how did this start? It took its beginning after the exodus from Jerusalem, when all the disciples went to live in Pella because Christ told them to leave Jerusalem. That's history talking. This is not the Bible. That's not, it's not like you can look it up in Galatians. This is historians writing about the, the followers of Christ exiting Jerusalem and to go away since it was under siege. Because of this advice, they came to Perea after having moved to that place, like I said. Um, Epiphanes also wrote on, in a book called On Weights and Measures, he wrote, so Aquila, when he went, when he was in Jerusalem, saw the disciples of the disciples of the apostles flourishing in the faith, working signs and healings and other miracles for they were such as had come back from the city of Pella to Jerusalem and were living there and teaching for when the city of Jerusalem was about to be taken and destroyed by the Romans, it was revealed in advance by an angel of God that all the disciples that they should remove from the city as it was going to be completely destroyed. They journeyed as immigrants in Pella, the city uh, above mentioned in Transjordania. And this city is said to be of the Decapolis. They left. Now, when we look at the prophecy of Zechariah, you're challenged with how should we look at this? Should we look at this as this is something that's going to happen thousands of years from the time it's delivered? I'm not saying it can't be. I, I can't speak authoritatively that there's not some great revival coming as a result of events that are happening in Israel right now. I don't know. Neither can I say, I don't know that it didn't already happen. Because the Spirit of God was moving. We, all these years later, have a tendency to forget. We should remember. Peter preached and thousands were saved. Right? For 40 years, Peter preached. James taught. The disciples worked there in Jerusalem. 
to think that there was not a mighty outpouring of God's spirit in the land, I think is to assume an awful lot. Now, let's say I believe one way and you believe another. You think it's yet future. I think it was fulfilled in the past. Well, what should we be doing today? Oh, well, did it change at all? Did it change in the least bit? What is the commission? Go into all the world and make? Uh, does that change if the Lord had ministered to Israel prophetically like Zechariah said in the past, if, as though he'd already fulfilled his word to him? Does it change that? What if he didn't? What if he's going to do it future? Does it change what we're supposed to be doing? When we look at the world right now and we see war going on in Israel, and it's crazy right now. Hannah has six people she went to school with CBI. They're in Israel today. Uh, Dave Rose's daughter is in the Golan Heights. So if you know anything about what's going on, that's not good. Does it change what we should be doing? What do we do when war breaks out in Israel? Now, if the Lord told us, he didn't say, you know what? I want you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem unless you think I already delivered some of the Jews. Did he say that? No, he said to do what? Pray for the peace. How often? All the time. So do we stop praying for the peace of Jerusalem? Now, I'm going to tell you that I believe that enemies of the cross use our disagreements about prophecy to divide us and make us ineffective so that we cannot uh, be a part of what's going on in the world at the time as things are going on. Because one way or the other, the ways I'm describing it, now next week we're going to meet uh, uh, Zechariah 14, which is the day of the Lord. We'll find a lot more uh, agreement <coughs> as we come to that point, which is the way most of these things work. We're good on the beginning and we're really good on the end. It's in the middle where in between where we're trying to say, how, when did this happen or how does this work out? Now, here's one of the things I want you to recognize as we close out. We don't have a lot of time, but I don't want to miss this. So what happens? What is the cause when all of this stuff goes on? What, what is being fulfilled? When the Lord delivers the third and he destroys two thirds, either time period, if you want to put it in the tribulation period yet to be determined, or you want to put it in the past, what is being accomplished in those times? They're being called on to make a decision. No? For whom? For the Lord? What did Joel write? Joel, this was, by the way, spoken over Acts chapter 2. Peter said, this is what the prophet Joel declared. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons... And your daughters shall prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will put out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heaven and on the earth, blood, fire, uh, columns of smoke, the sun turned to darkness, a moon to blood, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be oh everyone everyone who calls on the name of the lord shall be saved now listen to this phrase for in mount zion and in jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the lord calls romans 10 uses this same phrase romans 10 9 and 10 is a couple of my favorite verses. We're going to read <coughs> 9 through 13. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord 
is Lord over all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Why? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what occurs in Israel that Zechariah is talking about, I believe, is a believing Israel passing through the judgment that came upon the nation of Israel and then uh, moving forward in time. They're the reason why you have an Israel today. And people will ask me, well, Jackie, what's a, uh, what is the prophetic significance of Israel today? I don't know. Stand by. Let's see what happens. I know this, the Israel that exists today is unbelieving Israel. I've been there like 20 times. Okay, that might be exaggeration. I haven't really counted, but it seems like a lot. I've been there a lot. And Israel today is unbelieving Israel. So then, what should we be doing? We don't ignore them, do we? No, and that's why we have six students in Israel right now, who've been studying in Israel, it's a great opportunity, who are there right now during the, the battles that are taking place. And they are in a bad part of the nation. It would be way better for them to be south, but they're not south, they're north. And they're trying to get them out of the airport in Haifa. Um, they are currently in a bomb shelter, and currently, as of today, everybody's still Okay. So we need to pray because there's some crazy stuff going on in there. There's some evil men doing evil things, isn't there? Yeah. So they're fulfilling the purpose of the commission, right? Sitting in a bomb shelter, telling Jews who are in the bomb shelter with them. I wonder what the odds are that God would put them there just for something like that. Huh? So we want to make sure we keep them lifted up in prayer. And we want to look for opportunities to share the truth of who Christ is everywhere we go. Amen? All right, why don't you guys stand with me? Let's pray for <coughs> those who are there. And uh, I think we got a baptism tonight. So if you guys can, if you want to hang out, we're going to do a baptism. Somebody's getting wet. I, it'll be a contest whether me or Jordan are the most late. No, tell them no. Church is supposed to be over at 8. I'm already 10 minutes late. He ought, he's just going to have to learn how to end on time, huh? He's got a good teacher. Yeah, he's got no chance at all. Oh, let's pray. Father God, we just come before you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done, how you've provided for us, Lord, the doors you have opened for us. God, I pray that everybody here, it's not, uh, an argument isn't made because I make it or someone else does. Lord, we are challenged as students of the word to study the word and see if these things are so. So Lord, we pray that you would challenge us with the, with the prophetic word, that you would challenge us with the fulfillment therein, and that we would recognize as we desire to know, God, and understand <clears throat> who you are and what you've done, that we don't lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, we're still brothers and sisters. We're still part of the same family. We still have the same job. And last I checked, we're still saved because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, we pray for those students who are in Israel right now who have missiles flying around them, bombs landing, a crazy time when I'm sure you're filled with fear and trepidation. Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit, empower them to be your witnesses, put your uh, hedge of protection around them, keep them safe, deliver them from evil, and bring them home. And I pray, Lord, for those who will hear their hope and faith that they will make a profession for you, Lord, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
So, Lord God, we thank you that this is who you are and what you have done. We ask your blessing tonight. We pray your blessing on this baptism, Lord, and the opportunity uh, to stand in obedience with you. And we ask, God, that you watch over and keep us as we go from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, he, he made a booby trap out of this. <laughs> Was he having trouble too? I should just say, well, he must have been having trouble because he decided not to leave me a pick. <laughs> so it could be. <laughs> Father God, we ask as we go from this place, make us your hands and feet. Make us faithful with the gospel of good news that you have given, given to us through the ministry of reconciliation. God, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.